And I sometimes get this from, you know, parents, you know, my, you know, my son or my daughter, you know, is now an adult and, you know, has abandoned the faith entirely. But I remember at five, they prayed the prayer and that's where I'm pinning my hope. If you read through the book of Hebrews, it will disconnect you from that belief. You'll no longer believe that. You will need to endure to the end in order to be saved. Hi, I'm Dr. John Newfelt. Welcome to Back to the Bible Canada. Delighted to have you join me. We are in a study on the book of Hebrews, and we've come to Hebrews chapter two, which is really an important study. I mean, after everything that we've looked at in chapter one, and so if you haven't been with me, I wanna go back and you wanna see some of that teaching, but we've come to Hebrews chapter two in this important book. And as we get ourselves ready to launch into this, let me say a couple of things to set the table. We live in a day when you know, many of us have described our day as a day of information overload. You know, it's not possible to know everything anymore. The idea of having a Renaissance man or a Renaissance woman, I mean, that's long past us. There's way too much information out there for anyone to consume. Um, and so, you know, we have learned not only to concentrate on our areas of expertise, but we've also learned to basically tune out everything that's not essential. We have to, we have to learn the skill of tuning out a bunch of noises. There's no other way to survive in the kind of a world that we live in today. And in a way that's a good thing and in a way that's a bad thing. It's a good thing because anytime that we wanna learn something new because we need to or because we're interested, whatever the reason is, you know, there's all that information available and we know how to access it and we can study things in a very rapid order. It's a bad thing simply because tuning out is essential and because we've all learned to tune out, we just tune out all sorts of things in our lives that would be essential if we gave our attention to more of life than our little sliver of knowledge that we have. Uh, what I mean to say is there are a great many people who will tell you the statistics of their sports team and know everything about it and about the league and about history and the sports league and everything else, but don't know anything about God or eternal life or about the meaning of life or what happens to a person at death. And here's what I'm saying is that we have come to pay attention to stuff that's not ultimately valuable. And in the meantime, we pay attention to trivia and become experts in it. That's the great danger of living in the day in which we live. Well, here we are in the book of Hebrews, and uh, we know that we've already studied it enough to know that Hebrews is a book that's written to Jewish Christians uh, who, because of persecution, some of them were being tempted to go back to their former life in Judaism and to abandon Christ. And so this book is written to highlight the importance of Christ. I mean, if you abandon Christ, just how much would you lose? See, that's the important thing that's in this book. And so uh, that's where we've been in chapter one. And now we come to chapter two, and I'm reading verses one to four. And uh, I have them on my notes, so let me just read them straight from my notes. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation. It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard, while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. Now, this is a warning. I mean, I'm not telling you anything else. This is a warning. And you saw that already if you were paying attention as I was reading. This is a warning. So let me explain that this is the first warning in the book of Hebrews. There are, in fact, five of them. The second warning is found in Hebrews 3, 7 to 4, 13. If you're keeping track, you'll want to note that. There's a third one in Hebrews 5, 11 to chapter 6, verse 20. There's a fourth one in Hebrews 10, 19 to 39, and the last one is in Hebrews 12, the second last chapter, verses 14 to 29. The warnings are very direct, and they're very disconcerting. I mean, I would say anyone who believes that, you know, if you 
prayed the sinner's prayer whenever it was and now you're living like the devil today, it's okay because that prayer that you prayed back in you know whatever year it was, that should do you. If that's the idea that you hold, I mean, I sometimes get this from you know parents, you know, my you know, my son or my daughter, you know, is now an adult and, you know, has abandoned the faith entirely. But I remember at five, they prayed the prayer and that's where I'm pinning my hope. If you read through the book of Hebrews, it will disconnect you from that belief. You'll no longer believe that. You will need to endure to the end in order to be saved. Now, I'll say a lot more about, you know, whether or not we can be sure of our salvation. And yes, we can. But please notice that this warning of the book is the first one and it is really because it follows the discussion of just how great is Jesus. So if Jesus is the eternal son of God, if he is the radiance of the glory of God rather than just the reflection, if he is the exact imprint of the nature of the divine, if he not only created the universe, but moment by moment sustains it and upholds it, if all of that's true, if he's superior to all other things, if that's true, and it is, then you should pay closer attention. Pay attention, that's the whole idea. Pay attention, not just pay attention, notice the qualifiers. Pay much attention. Pay undivided attention. Uh, don't let yourself get distracted. Pay closer attention. Look more deeply into the subject matter that we've already had. Don't allow yourself, you know, because of all the information that's available in our day, don't allow yourself to get distracted. Make sure that this one isn't something that you tune out. This is that valuable. Now, that's the positive command, pay attention, and then follows a negative. And the negative is, lest we drift away. Now, drifting away, that in fact, in the Greek is a nautical word. It comes from the world of shipping. So you can imagine that in the ancient world where they didn't have GPS systems the way we do today, um, so they're, they're mapping their course by the stars, and if you get off course just a little bit and you drift from the course that you have over a series of miles as you continue to go on, the drift will become larger and larger and larger till you lose your way and you don't know where you are. And as you know, if you've ever spent any time on the ocean, there are no markers on the ocean as there are on the land. So you don't know where you are and you could be hopelessly lost because you've allowed a drift to happen. Or you can imagine, you know, maybe a, a ship is moored somewhere off the coast and so you'd moor it, but uh, it's not been well moored. And over the night, you know, the ropes come loose and everyone's sleeping on board the ship, and they wake up in the morning, and they haven't recognized they've drifted overnight. They wake up, there's no land in sight, they're out in the open ocean. They have no idea where they are. That's the idea. Don't allow that to happen spiritually in your own life. Don't drift away. That's the idea behind it. You know, it's interesting because as I think about this, uh, I think about something that uh, theologian Kevin DeYoung said. He said, sliding into liberalism, and please don't misunderstand what is meant by liberalism. It's not a political term, it's a spiritual term. That is, if you do no longer hold to you know, the truth of scripture. So he said, sliding into liberalism is when you no longer take the time to make the effort to define your terms. Let me say it again. Sliding into liberalism is when you no longer take the time to make the effort to define your terms. I mean, this is paying attention. Understand what the words mean. Understand what's being described to us. So, for instance, when Jesus is called Son of God, what does that mean? I mean, we just don't say the words, we actually define them. We mean he's the eternal Son of God. You know, somebody said, well, if he's the Son of God, then he must have been created at some point in time. Well, that's only if he's not the Son. You see, if I have a son, my son is fully human as I am fully human. But if God has a son, then the, the son of God must be fully God even as he is God. You see, you need to define your terms, be clear about it. What's meant by son of God? Pay attention. What's meant by son of man? Pay attention. What's meant by the radiance of his glory? What's meant by the exact imprint of his nature? You see, Pay attention to the actual terms themselves. Pay close attention. I mean, we might say that about all of Christian theology. What is meant by words like redemption? 
What's meant by justification? What do we mean when we say repentance? What is faith actually? What do these words mean? No, not just sloppy definitions, but an actual definition. That's the point. I know there are some people that will hear this and say, you know, I'm just not given to Christian theology. I'm a Christian, but I just don't do theology and that precision that you're talking about now, I just, I don't know, I've just never gotten into that. And so my response is, well then, what have you gotten into? And the answer is often, well, you know, it's the practical stuff. And my response is always, like what? Well, I mean, you know, the Christian faith provides me hope and it provides me joy. And when things are going tough, you know, God's still with me. And, you know, those are the things that people talk about often. And so because they talk only about those kind of issues and never the actual definitions of who God is, who his son Jesus is, what is the work of salvation, how does it function in our lives, where's our authority, all of that kind of stuff. So when those things are not precise, like an ancient sailor who's out on the boat, who's not marking clearly the pathway before him, a drift has been allowed to happen. And at first is, you know, you don't even recognize how far you've drifted. Uh, It was Dr. L. Moeller who said, that when it comes to embracing the gospel message, he said the true gospel comes to us in the form of conversion. That is, we're confronted by our sins. We're confronted by the truth of Christ. It's explained to us what Christ actually accomplished on the cross, and then we are told what our response to that message must be. In other words, this comes to us in such a way that we are forced to make a decision. But on the other hand, when it comes to liberalism, it simply comes in one little drip after another, one little course that's gone astray after another. In liberalism, we don't make a decision, we drift into a way of life. And if you wanna stop drifting, You've got to start paying attention more deeply, have an undivided attention. Wake up! What is actually the message of the gospel? Know what it actually says. You know, that leads me to, you know, one of my hobby horses, and maybe I'm speaking to parents here who've, you know, let's say you've got, you know, uh, uh, kids that are still living in your home, but they're getting a little older, and you know the day of graduation is before them, and you're wondering what the next step is. You know, I've been a long-time believer in finding a good Bible school. And here's what I'm saying. I'm not saying a Bible college where you have all sorts of liberal arts courses that need to be taken along with everything else and you sometimes have you know, pseudo-Christian professors. Uh, what I mean is taking some time away where there's only Bible. Bible, Bible, Bible. I mean, it's a great thing. Two years and just deeply immerse people in the text of Scripture, help them to understand the categories, help them to know what's in the Bible books, let them look deeply into it and let it burrow deep into their hearts. I mean, you do that at that critical time in their lives, then let them go to a secular university or a secular trade school or whatever they do after that, and believe me, they're going to be equipped. But if you're only half equipped, and if you only know a bit about the text of Scripture, and it's not precise, and your knowledge is not deep, you don't even understand how far you've drifted, and that's the point that's being said here. So that's the command of Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1. Pay more attention, not less attention. Double down. Think more deeply, expand your knowledge, stop being distracted, be very clear what is meant by the biblical definitions, especially when it comes to the deity of Jesus. What exactly is being said? Well, let's move on. Having been given the basic command, the book of Hebrews now gives us two reasons why we wanna pay attention, and that's the the rest of these, these four verses that I've read. Here's the first reason, so, Go back again to verse one. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention. I mean, therefore, because we've learned about the supremacy of Christ, we must pay much closer attention to what we've heard, lest we drift away from it. And then the reason, verses two to three a, for, because, since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape 
if we neglect so great a salvation. So do you understand how this goes? If you look at the Old Testament, the message declared by angels, which we've already learned as we've studied through, through the book of Hebrews, the message declared by angels is the law of God that was given through the mediation of angels. They safeguarded the giving of the law. So the, the, if that message, that is the Old Testament message that came to us under the leadership of Moses, if that message came so that every transgression, that is every time you violated the revealed will of God in the Old Testament, you got a just retribution. If that's true of that, how much more should we be warned about neglecting the salvation that has come in our day? So let me see if I can you know, get some sense of that. In the Old Testament, there are a number of laws that are given that are required of God's people. You know, if you read through the book of Leviticus, and I know some of you are saying, I've tried, it's been difficult. I, carry on, keep trying. Keep trying until you make it. But in the entire book of Leviticus, which is a very detailed description of what sacrifices look like and what foods are clean and unclean and you know all these different laws, um, when you go through that, you'll recognize that there's only one account, one story in it. Everything else is just legalese all the way through. But the story happens in Leviticus 10. Aaron, the high priest, has two sons. Oh, he has four, but two of them, They are Nadab and Abihu. Nadab and Abihu are called upon to go into the, um, you know, the tabernacle itself and to burn incense before the Lord. That's part of their duties as a priest. The law requires them to do that. They go in on this occasion, but rather than having the formula or the recipe for the exact kind of incense that they were allowed to burn, they decide to bring any old incense into the temple. And what we find out from that chapter is the anger of the Lord burned against them and he killed them on the spot. <laughs> you know, it's fascinating. You say, wow, over something like that. Yeah, because the law required that you do it exactly the way that God told you to do it. And if you didn't, there was a just retribution from God for failing to obey him exactly as the law required. That's how the Old Testament read. And that's why in Leviticus 10, verse 2, you know, fire came out before the Lord and consumed them. And then the next verse, verse 3, then Moses said to Aaron, that is the dad of the two boys that were killed, Moses said to Aaron, the dad, this is what the Lord has said. Among those who are near to me, the priests, I will be sanctified or I'll be regarded as holy. And before all people, I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. In other words, don't violate the word of God. God demands that you do it. Well, you know, there's a number of other examples in the Old Testament of just such a thing. You go to Numbers chapter 16, and it's the very famous rebellion of a man by the name of Korah. He's joined by two other people. One is named Dathan, and the other is named Abiram. And uh, Korah, Dathan, and Abiram uh, decide to lead a rebellion against Moses, the man that God has chosen to lead his people. We don't want Moses as our leader. We're going to choose our own. And here's the outcome of the matter. Number 16, 32 to 33. And the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up with their households and the people who belonged to Korah and all their goods. So they and all that belonged to them went down alive into Sheol, into hell. And the earth closed over them and they perished from the midst of the assembly. That's what's meant When the writer of Hebrews says, every transgression, every disobedience received a retribution from God. I mean, you get to the book of Deuteronomy, which is the last of the books of the law, and Deuteronomy 29, verse 58, says that if you're not careful to do all the words of the law that are written in this book, verse 59 says, then the Lord will bring on you and your offspring extraordinary afflictions severe and lasting, it says. So it's filled with warnings. Don't you dare take as a minor thing these laws that I've given you. I will call an accounting to a person who doesn't pay attention. See, that's that's the point behind all of that. And ultimately, there's this big hunk in the middle of our Old Testament, and it fills a great many books, and it's the description of the Babylonian captivity 
in which in 586 BC, the Babylonian army moved in onto Jerusalem and destroyed Jerusalem, and all the prophets said, yes, this happened because the people would not pay attention to the commands of God. They simply neglected them, and God sent prophets to warn them, you'd better pay attention, and eventually it led to utter cataclysm and disaster. That's why the book of Hebrews later, the author will say, it's a terrible thing to fall into the hands of the living God. You have to get that impression if you pay any attention to the First Testament. Sometimes, you know, the Old Testament, I, I love to use the word the First Testament for the first 39 books of our Bible. And that's the idea that you get. So some people might say, well, is the New Testament that way? I mean, does it warn us also that severely? So look again at what Hebrews says. I'm reading here from verse two. For since the message, the Old Testament message, declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we, now being New Testament believers, how shall we escape? Do you think that we're gonna escape? They didn't, and you think we're going to? If we neglect or don't pay attention to so great a salvation. See, it's the argument from the lesser to the greater. What's lesser? Well, the lesser happens to be in the, in the Old Testament. The greater happens to be what happens when Jesus reveals his gospel. So how does this work out? You know, somebody might say, well, no, 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 that, it's, it's greater in the, in the New Testament because all the threat of retribution is no longer there. Well, think again. Think again. So uh, let me take you to the book of Luke and chapter 19. And there's an important chapter here, and it happens during you know, the Easter season as we think of it today. But it's Jesus riding into Jerusalem that first day um, when he comes into the city and is eventually crucified. But it says in Luke chapter 19, verse 41, and when he drew near and saw the city, talking about Jesus, he wept over it saying, would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes, for the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you, and they will not leave one stone upon another. Why? Because you did not know the time of your visitation. You didn't honor the fact that the chosen Messiah of God, who is me, says Jesus, is riding into Jerusalem, and because you did not honor me as the one who was sent by God as your savior. You neglected so great a salvation. This city is gonna be torn stone by stone to the ground, and your children and you are gonna be killed within it. Well, we know that's exactly what happened. In fact, you know, just the other day, my wife and I were, you know, watching a, a, a video, which was a recreation of AD 70, which was uh, what the uh, Jewish historian Josephus called the War of the Jews, in which the Romans came in fulfillment of these very words into the city. Uh, the, the war lasted for, you know, five to six months. The Romans had lost so many key soldiers. The battle was so engaged and so heated month after month. And now they're in the middle of the blazing hot summer and tempers are at the breaking point. So at the time when the Romans finally won the victory, they wouldn't even accept terms of surrender from the Jews. They simply went in and slaughtered mercilessly everyone. Jesus said, this occurred because you did not understand the day of your visitation. Now, I gotta say something, for me personally, I mean, just again, reviewing the events of AD 70, my heart was just broken again. I mean, anyone who's truly a, a Christian, a follower of Jesus, even if you're a Gentile, you are given because of the scriptures themselves to love the people of Israel. I mean, if you don't love the people of Israel, you need to repent of that. You need to have a deep affection for the historic people of God. It needs to live in your heart. You need to be on the side of Israel. I just need to say that. But at the same time, you recognize that there was a great slaughter that had been planned. And if that happened to them, you think it will be better for you if you neglect so great a salvation? That's the message of Hebrews. I mean, listen to what Jesus said to the people of Capernaum who had where Jesus had done more miracles than any other place on earth, listen to what Jesus said to them. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? 
you will be brought down to Hades, for if the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained to this day. But I tell you, it will be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom than for you. See what Jesus is saying? You're not paying attention. And do you think it will go better for you? Or listen to Matthew chapter 18, verse nine. Jesus is saying, if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better that you enter life with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into the hell of fire. Don't deliberately keep on sinning. Don't neglect what is being offered you. Don't just simply allow yourself to be distracted and take no attention either to what the scripture says or what the doctrines of God say or how your own life should be in obedience to that. You let this stuff go. You just pass this stuff by and say, it's not that important. If you let that happen, it will be worse for you than it was for those in the Old Testament that suffered such cataclysms. That's the point behind all of this. Can you lose your salvation then? You know, that's what people say. And my, my response to that is, I don't think that you can, and here's why. The warnings in Hebrew uh, in Hebrews are instructive because they remind us that we ought to deeply take note of the state of our own lives. You see, I would think that it would be the mark of a true believer that when we hear a warning, it awakens our heart. Pay attention. And we say, oh yes, thank you, Lord, for reminding me to pay attention. But if you're not a true believer, these words will be like water off a duck's back. You'll have heard the warning and you'll go on in your own way. So really, these words are a marker to help you to understand, is your faith genuine or not? Genuine believers wake up and pay attention. Those who are not genuine, they simply fall away and walk away and do nothing about it. So that's the first thing. Notice how terrible it will go for you. Now, let's continue to read because I said that there's two reasons why you want to pay attention. The first one is, if you don't, things go badly for you. Now, notice the second reason, and it's found here in Hebrews 2, verse 3b to 4. It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard, while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. So here's the second reason to pay attention. It's not a warning this time, is it? Instead, it's a statement of just how gracious and how precious the gospel that you have received actually is. First of all, it came to you from the Lord himself. Jesus himself, God come to us in human flesh, walked among us, performed great miracles. And then the Lord spoke, taught his disciples so that it was attested to us by those who heard. Those who heard means the apostles that Jesus had appointed who wrote to us the New Testament so that we can read about it. So they did that, and then it says, and it was attested by those who heard, God bore witness by signs and wonders. So is the signs and wonders here referring to the signs and wonders that Jesus did, or the signs and wonders that the apostles did? Well, I think it's both. I mean, the reality is, Jesus did many miracles, but so also did Peter and Paul and, and John. I mean, they also did great miracles to reaffirm that the message that they were sharing with us was the genuine message God was attesting to it. He was putting his marker on it and saying, yes, this is me speaking, and I'm giving you all the evidence that you know. And then it says in the end, it also came to us through gifts of the Holy Spirit. In other words, God continues to give gifts to God's people today to continue to be a marker, the Holy Spirit living within us, that all of this stuff is genuine. So you have every reason for knowing just how genuine all of this is. And because it's genuine, because it's the word of God, my dear friend, it's not the word that you heard on the internet. It's not somebody who told somebody, who told your mom, who told you. I mean, it's not that. It's come to us directly out of heaven. The creator himself, he who cannot err, he was altogether glorious, has spoken. I mean, if you neglect other things, don't neglect this. I mean, you might neglect, I mean, your own workplace, and you, know, you shouldn't. You should continue to pay attention to make sure that your life continues to be economically viable. But if you have a choice, you should neglect your own work and not neglect this. See, that's the point I'm saying. There is 
No more important word than the word that has come to us from God. Pay attention. Pay more attention. Pay much more attention. Be undivided in your focus. Recognize that there's a lot of stuff that happens in life, but keep coming back to this. I mean, you may be having to ignore a whole bunch of stuff because there's way too much information out there about everything, and that's okay. But about this, this is the very area where you're going to be wanting to be an expert. Don't neglect this. We're talking about God sending his son who came to us and who is of the divine imprint. The, the imprint of the divine is in him. He is not the reflection of the glory of God. He's the radiance of the glory of God. Don't give this up, no matter what else you do. That's the point behind all of this. Now, how do you end all of this? He ended by saying, let's be reminded that there are so many things that clamor for our attention in the day that we live. I wanna end by telling a little story. I was sitting um, on a beautiful summer's day outside of a coffee shop. I had a book in my hand and I was reading and a man came and asked whether or not he could sit beside me. Lots of tables were filled, lots of people sitting outside. I said, hey, sit down. Um, and so we started to talk. And uh, he was a kind of an interesting guy. He claimed that he knew a little bit of something about everything. <laughs> I know that's not true, um, but I let him talk, you know, and I said, well, that's, that's interesting because there's lots of stuff I don't know anything about. So pretty soon he's telling me about, you know, all the natural forms of remedies for whatever ails us. And I just listen. And somehow, you know, he said, how much do you know about this? And I said, yeah, not a lot. Um, and he said, well, you should know more. And so I said, hey, let me ask you something. Um, you know, you say you know a lot about stuff. So let me ask you about your own spiritual life. What do you know about that? And after a little while of discussing things, it became very clear to me that he had never heard, never read the Bible. Uh, he had never he heard of Abraham, even though Abraham and his message has clearly impacted one half of the earth's population. What I'm saying is that the most significant thing in all of life had been neglected from this man who looked to be well in his 60s. And I'm thinking, yeah, for a lifetime, he has been neglecting a God who speaks to him. Look, that happens all the time. And I guess what I'm saying is, don't let that happen to you. Don't even drift one iota. Pay attention, be focused, and continue to give attention to the Word of God and to the state of your own soul, recognizing that there is no greater delight for the human mind than to think much on the person of Jesus. Hey, thanks for being a part of Back to the Bible Canada today, and thanks for being a part of this study in the book of Hebrews. May the Lord bless you and have a wonderful day. Thank you for watching today, and I want to ask you to make sure that you hit the like button and also subscribe to this channel so that you can receive any further notifications of all the videos that we prepare for you. Um, thank you so much for being a part of Back to the Bible Canada.